before we service the people. So are you glad to be here this evening? Oh, man, come on now. Let's go, y'all. I mean, this is powerful. When you look next to your na neighbor, I mean, we have about 235 black businesses that are here today. I mean, come on, 235, everybody. This is definitely the largest um, black business expo that we've had here in the city in some years. And it is just the beginning. I'm just excited what God is doing and just definitely honored that you guys would even support the real Black Friday. So just, I know I see some new faces here in the building. The Black Friday, the real Black Friday started in 2014. This week is actually our two-year anniversary. We've been doing it for three August, but it's our second year. And currently, if you're not on the realblackfriday.com, we actually have close to about 600 businesses that are on the directory. And it's continued to grow just in the last three to four weeks. We've had about 112 new businesses sign up. 112, everybody. Man, y'all got to come on, y'all. Y'all in church, give it up, y'all. <laughs> so we, um, it, and now, you know, it's evolving. We have, you know, doctors registering. We have architects res registering, great restaurants here in our city. We have, I'll say, distributors rest, uh, that are registering. So a variety of businesses that are registering and just becoming aware just of the power of us working together. And you'll see throughout today, we'll talk throughout our program. We're going to show you some very dynamic videos so you can see what we've been doing in this community come alive. I mean, it's been real impactful. We were just in the back room talking. Mr. Frazier, Mr. Graham, and just a team about not just the, the support we were getting from the small businesses, but since we started beyond just the Real Black Friday, we do financial literacy. Now, who knows that we've been offering that here in the city this past year? You, you've been hearing that? To this date, we're up to $56 million in life insurance purchased between here and New York. So when we talk about legacies, we're not just talking about building black businesses to be around just for today, but for, for forever, for, so we can see generational businesses occur. If, you, if I were to ask anybody in the crowd, name five businesses right here in our city that have been around for at least five generations. Take a minute and think about that. Could you give me five? You can name five? So that was one person that said five. <laughs> So it's not many, though, guys, but so we're, we're trying to transform that. So again, just glad to have everybody here. It's, the city's on their, on their way. The excitement's in the city. We have the radio stations here. When we open those doors, I mean, it's going to be an amazing sight if you haven't been here before. So I just want to, again, thank you uh, for supporting the Real Black Friday. It's just to begin into the things that we're doing. We have some dynamic plans that we're working not just locally, you know, from Columbus to D.C., so you guys are going to really see some impactful things happen right here in our city. Economic impact. My background is finance. So when you talk to me, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about jobs being created. I want to talk about us owning the buildings that we're in, from renters to owners. Let's own the real estate in our community. I want to talk about building black banks in here, which is the financial infrastructure of where we're going. I want to talk about creating wealth for the owners that put all the hard work in that don't nobody see. Can we get some? Come on now. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up Monica Green, who is one of my partners. When I started the Real Black Friday in 14, it was three entrepreneurs that I called here in the city. It was Monica Green, um, and we called Maisha Wilson from New Life Fitness, and then Greg Beckham from Beckham's B&M's. And when I say they have been in it since the beginning with me, the late night meetings, in the basements, so or wherever we had to meet to get it done. But it's been amazing just the strategies we've been able to put together and do things with the right heart and the right motives to make sure we saw some real change. So I just want to publicly thank you for being here today and always being so supportive. And we got some great things coming. So thank you, Monica. Okay. Let's give it up for Larice for the visionary. It's rare when uh, we have someone who actually does what they say. And so I just appreciate the fact that he's doing exactly what it is that he said he was going to do. How many business owners uh, are in the room right now? 
All right, well, what's getting ready to happen in a few minutes? I had a sneak peek in the back. <laughs> I am so excited. You want to talk about Believe Land? We can call ourselves Believe Land, and what you're going to hear, you're going to be so excited and in charge, in charge with. Before uh, Mr. Graham comes, I'd like to introduce Mr. Frazier, George Frazier, Cleveland's own George Frazier. You can <laughs> come on up. Let's give it up for Mr. Frazier. Such a blessing to have him in our town, nationally known, does great work. Mm -hmm. Let's give it up. Let's give it up some more for Mr. Frazier. All right, get ready, everybody. About to have a great time. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. This evening is not about me. It is about a good friend who is blessing us with his time, talent, and treasure, Stedman Graham. Stephen Graham. I love this brother. I met him in an elevator in Chicago 20 years ago, going to a party. We were going to the same party. A guy by the name of Bertram Lee, who's the first black uh, NBA owner of the Denver Nuggets, was a pioneer in black television ownership. And we were going to the same party, and we struck up a conversation in the elevator. And I fell in love with this guy, and I'm not gay. I'm, I'm, I'm straight, okay, I'm straight, I'm straight. But I, I, I fell in love with his heart, I fell in love with his mind, I fell in, I mean, in a short conversation on the elevator, we clicked, we clicked. I wrote a book about clicking. So you click with someone when three things are in perfect alignment, chemistry, fit, and timing. Chemistry, fit, and timing. And so the chemistry was right, the fit was right. He was doing powerful things in the community. He was a servant leader. He was a servant leader. He understood the purpose of life, which is to love, to give, to serve, and to add value to somebody and something. He was all about that 20 years ago. I was impressed with them. We stayed in touch. We committed ourselves to each other's initiatives. He was working with kids at the time. He's still working with them. I said, listen, anything I can do to serve you in your quest and in your dream, count me in. And uh, he said the same thing. And then several years later, we started the Power Networking Conference right here in Cleveland. And Stedman served uh, as one of our leadership development speakers at one of the most uh, powerful and impactful workshops at the Power Networking Conference. So he did that for three or four years with us. And so I've been known, and we've been keeping in touch. And, you know, here's a brother that's married to probably one of the most recognizable women on the planet, right? And he has handled that relationship and has managed that relationship in such a way that not only has he grown because of that relationship, but she has grown because of that relationship as well. So I just want to read a couple of things about Graham, uh, Stedman. Stedman uh, served in the United States Army. He later played basketball professionally in the European League. He holds a bachelor's degree in social work from Hardin-Simmons University. He received a master's degree in education from Ball State University and an honorary doctor degree in uh, humanities from Corker College. So he's actually Dr. Stedman Graham. Um, one quick story about Stedman. Uh, when the information went out over social media that Seven and I would be together, I would be doing an interview with them. That's what those two chairs are about. This is a true story, and I'm going to give you the email that I got about an hour after my good friend Haki Amini saw this piece. He emailed it to me, and, and he said, uh, I'm going to read this to you so you don't think I'm lying. And I printed it out for Seven. Because this is so crazy. George, an amazing thing happened when I picked up Stedman's book from a free bookstore about three years ago. I had the book in my car on the back seat for about a year. I was intending on reading it, but I didn't get to it. So finally, I picked it up about three months ago. It's a true story. I'm going to give this to you because you need to, you need to own this. And he said there were five crisp $100 bills in the book. 
Again, I had had the book for about a year. I bought it, not bought it, but got it from a free bookstore, and I was sitting on my back seat, and I was waiting for food, and I said, let me pick up this book while I was waiting, and he looked at it, and there were five $100 bills planted inside of the book. Now, I know Stedman. I have done the same thing with success runs in our race because, you know, the old saying is if you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. So when I was, when that book was hot, Stedman, I would put a hundred dollar bill, Richard, around the last pages of the book with my business card and said, if you find this one hundred dollars, call me. I never got a call. Never got a call. So 1.1 million bucks. So I, Stedman obviously did be one better. He put five $100 bills in his book. Somebody bought that book, didn't read it, Stedman, went to a free bookstore and gave it to them to give away. And my, my friend picked it up. He was $500 rich. He said he thought he, he was looking around because he thought maybe he had stolen something. So that's, a, that's just, a, I think, a, a, a tidbit of, of the kind of generosity this, this young brother he is a young brother. He's young in heart and young in spirit. So please give a warm welcome while I sit and chat with Dr. Stephen Graham. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. George? pleasure to be here at the Word Church, and uh, always good to hang with my brother, George Fraser. Appreciate all the work you've done. Round of applause right here, ladies and gentlemen. He's, he's a pioneer. I have a real special friend, uh, David, over here. David, stand up a minute. It's real special. He brought me here, and Appreciate him, David Reynolds, the Key Bank. Okay, here we are. Congratulations to y'all, because it takes round of applause for y'all, because it takes a lot to be an entrepreneur. It takes a lot to be a business person. It takes a lot to be able to make your own money. Okay, y'all think I don't make my own money, right? <laughs> That's the only way I can survive. Make your own money. That's right. I'm ready. Okay. I got, I, Go ahead. I, I want to do two things. I want to read a couple of quotes from you, and I want you to expand on these quotes. The first one is, this is Stedman talking. Times of change are times of opportunity, but only people who are secure in their identity can see beyond immediate obstacles and take full advantage of the extraordinary opportunities offered by the times in which we live. Will you expand on the identity thing? Yeah, I, uh, wow, I'm so fortunate and blessed to discover identity as my life's mission. And to be able to teach people, not, not only teach myself and work on myself, but to teach people how to find out who they are. And it's a blessing to be able to, I just left South Africa, and it's a blessing to be able to go anywhere in the world. I trained 3,000 refugees and immigrants in Amsterdam, teaching about identity. And poverty is the result of a lack of identity. Poverty is the result of, of not understanding who you are and what's possible for you, regardless of the circumstances. And most people will never be able to find their identity because it's not even set up for you to be able to create self-mastery. And that's what finding your identity is. It's about self-development and self-efficacy and self-management and self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And Maslow's highest level of development is self-actualization. Mm -hmm. mm. 
And the problem with uh, victimization is victimization, when you blame somebody else for your circumstances, you will always be a slave. Ooh. And it's set up for slavery. It's set up for you to be a follower. It's set up for you to be a consumer, not a producer, unless you have the information. Now, if I can keep you from the information of freedom, then I don't have to worry about you making any money. I don't have to worry about you going into business. I don't have to worry about you self-actualizing because you will always victimize yourself. And you'll never get to business because you're so focused on your dysfunction as a human being. And so it's called inward hate. And your ability to be able to look at yourself and, and see not much self-worth. It's the lack of value. It's the lack of confidence. It's the lack of courage because you don't know who you are. And the, and the system, you know, is not even designed for you because most of the time we don't even know, we're not even conscious of our ability to self-actualize to self because we're so busy working and surviving. Mm -hmm. And we get up in the morning, we'll wash the face, we brush our teeth, we get something to eat, we get the kids off to school, we work all day, we come home in the afternoon, we spend time with the family, we watch TV, we go to bed, maybe we dream that's Monday. Then on Tuesday, we... Get up in the morning, we we'll wash our face, we brush our teeth, we get some meat, we get the kids off to school, we work all day, we come home in the afternoon, we spend time with the family, we watch TV, we go to bed, maybe we dream that's Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, we get up in the morning, we wash our face, we brush our teeth, we, you know, we do all the things we do on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we, and, and Monday we start back to work. And we go to work, and we never get a chance to self-actualize, think, develop, or build anything because we're too busy slaving. And we look back after 30 years and we have no more in the end than we had in the beginning. We were broken when we started, we're still broke. Because there is no development. And then the world says, okay, I got you working. 1% runs the world, everybody else is working. I got you working and slaving, right? Now I'm going to fix the school so you don't learn anything in school. And then the school is a failed system. It teaches you how to memorize, take tests, repeat the information back, get labeled with a grade, and two weeks later, you forget the information. So let's figure it out. If you're doing the same thing over and over every single day, which is nothing, everything you learn in school you forget, which is nothing. Nothing from nothing is nothing. So you can't build nothing because you're not working with nothing. Right. Unless you get the information, unless you understand how to take information, education, and make it relevant to your purpose in life, transfer it to your mind so you become a thinking human being, you become a learner. Because now you're not learning anything. And you can't be successful in business unless you become a learner. So unless you're able to take information, education, make it relevant to your, your purpose in life, transfer it to your mind so you have a consciousness of learning and thinking and then transfer it to the American Free Enterprise System or the global market to create and shape your own future in the 24 hours that you have every single day, which is the only thing that makes you equal. Everybody has 24 hours. This is not about your color. The question is, what do you do in your 24 hours? And most people are not doing anything. They're not doing anything or going anywhere. So they're just complaining and looking to the outside world to what? To take care of you, not realizing nobody cares about you. They only care about themselves. They don't care about you. Right. And so if they only care about yourself, the secret is work on yourself. Yeah. Self-actualize yourself. Create self-mastery within yourself. Right. Take charge of your own development. So that's the foundation that I had to understand to be able to figure out, okay, it's not about the external world because they're going to define you. Right. And they're going to define you by your race and they're going to put you in a box, in a socially constructed, designed box, pretty, 
and tell you that you can't make it because of the color of your skin. And they transfer that information all over the world and put it through media and communication channels, making you think that you're substandard because of the color of your skin. And the color of your skin is not going to change. You can change your mind, but you can't change the color of your skin. Right. 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 So you buy into that label. And then the world says, well, okay, I got the, I got the black folks. I'm going to put them in the box. I got the people of color. I'm, I'm going to make them think that they're substandard. Okay, they bought into that. Millions of people bought into that. Let me go to the women. And then they put the women in the box. And then they say to the women, you can't make it because it's a man's world. Wrong. You can't make it because you don't know who you are. And then they go and they say, well, I'm going to define you by your house and your car, your money and your religion. I'm going to define you by your, 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 your family. Mother, father might have said, son, you're nothing, never, never going to be anything. Defined by that. You're buying to that message. And I know this very clearly because I was labeled, labeled by race, you know, a long time. You know, I thought I had, thought I had a race-based consciousness. I thought it was about race. It took me 31 years before I realized I was traveling around with this guy named Bob Brown. We were going all around the world. And I realized I got it wrong. It's not about race. Your problem is you don't know who you are. And then I grew up with two disabled brothers in my family. Low self-esteem, lack of confidence. I thought it was about family. I thought it was about my brothers. No, your problem was you don't know who you are. And then the world started defining define me by my relationship. You know, I'm sure some of y'all said it. Who, who's, who's coming to speak? I think Oprah's man's coming to speak. I'm sure y'all said it. Don't say y'all didn't say it. And I had to realize it's not about my relationship. When you know who you are, you can do and create anything you want. Right. And you can add value to your relationship. And so I had to change my thinking. And so I adjust my thinking based on my talents and my skills and my abilities. And when you do that, you're not looking for the outside world for, to define you. The only person that should be defining you is you. So you, when any, somebody defines you by your race or your background or your family, or whatever the case may be, you got to be able to take your power back. The freedom is taking your power back, working on your talents, working on your skills, working on your passions, working on your business, so that you're able to have the controls to define yourself and build yourself and create a process for continuous improvement in the 24 hours that you have every single day. That's what I call freedom. And you don't even have to tell nobody. You just have to work at it and build yourself and create it based on your abilities. And it's called, to me, it's called self-development and self-mastery. And when you have any problems, all you have to do is work on self. That's a long answer to that question. So that, that's a good answer, though. Now, I wanted you to give a long answer because I wanted you to get that out. Um, it was Dr. John Henry Clark said, what do people do for themselves depends upon what they think about themselves, all right? And so if you think little of yourself, you're going to do little. Um, how do we, I mean, what you said is very deep. How do we break this cycle of not only low self-esteem, but low race esteem. See, when, see, if I don't love me, there's no way that I can love you, because when I look at you, you become a reflection of me, right? Um, and, and, and that's low race esteem, which is driven by low self-esteem. It's one of the reasons we don't recycle our dollars. It's one of the reasons we don't collaborate, collaborate in the ways that we should be collaborating. It's, you know, how do we break this cycle? Because you're right, no one's going to do this for us but us, and you're going to do it for yourself. You, How do we break the George, cycle? You, you really, it's almost impossible to break the cycle with the current mindset that we have. So changing mindset is one. You got to be able to change your thinking, number one. But changing your thinking, wow, I got to change my thinking. I'm hardwired. I mean, I've been thinking like this for 40 years, and right. you want me to go back and change my thinking? Right. That's like, you know, it's almost impossible. And now I have to work on it. 
and I got to go back to grandma and mom and where I came from and them yelling and screaming sometime in the house and I picked up their habits and I've been in that household for 17, 18 years and now you want me to change? My thinking. You know, your thinking and be somebody your program. else. Yeah, your, your program. Software. Right. Which is hardwired into your brain. Right. So when you get close to the wall, you say, well, you know what, I want, I want to take that job opportunity. I want, to, uh, I want to learn something new. You can't learn it because you are, it's ingrained in your brain so deep, you, emotionally, you're not even capable of doing it. And so first you have to have consciousness about what you're doing. And then you have to, it's a word called belief. You've got to believe in yourself. And we're not, forget about color. We're not talking about black. We don't want that label. We want to elevate ourselves to human being, to Americans. So the ability to be able to now eliminate all those negativity, neg negative messages. I don't know if I can do that because that's so hardwired in my, my brain and my emotions that you know, I don't know if I can transform to love which is really the key. The transformation is always love. And, and so your ability to be able to uh, change your thinking is based on, number one, is, is creating a better design so that negativity doesn't become a design for your life based on your current program. So you've got to create new information. And the ability to do that will never happen if you, if you focus on an average learning system and you're involved in an average system that only teaches you how to be average. So you've got to pull yourself out of that system. That's why I love Word Church and what you're doing right now. Because they're pulling you out of that traditional what? Slave system that's average, right? And you're like, I don't know if I can, I want to go. I don't know if I really want to come to this church and put up a, a booth and do all of that. Because yeah, yeah. I got to get out of my normal routine. That's right. And my normal routine is very comfortable, right? right? And as long as it's very comfortable, you don't have to do anything. Because it takes a lot of effort to do what you're doing. I applaud you because what it takes to be able to do this and change your habits. It's about the habits. Can you change your habits and set new goals yes. based on a vision? Yeah. We, we have, yeah, that's, that's powerful. And, the, that's and, powerful. and, and right, the powerful thing is that can you have a vision bigger than your circumstances? Right. Poverty is doing this, sitting in the same chair, doing the same thing, thinking the same thoughts over and over every single day. Vision allows you to see beyond yourself and see what's possible for you as a business as creating opportunities beyond your current circumstances. As a human being as well. That means you have to get out, get out of the box. You gotta do things differently. And the 21st century says, you gotta be a self-directed learner. You gotta be a self-starter. You gotta start thinking for yourself. Because right. they're gonna eliminate you, right? 99% of the people are going backwards. Middle class is going backwards. And, and they're gonna replace you with robots and technology. So unless you become a learner, unless you've got a learning process that teaches you how to be better than you were yesterday and develop a process continuous improvement, you're always going to be in poverty. Always going to be, always going to have less than. Yeah. So you've got to constantly change the thinking. When? When, y'all? Now and when? And when? Every day. Every day, right. Every day you have to be better. So you have to have different goals, different habits, different opportunities, a different database, and you couldn't have a better opportunity, George, now than any other time in the history of the world, y'all, because you have what? You have technology. But stop using technology just to do what? To talk about what? Nothing. Sending a bunch of emails talking about nothing. Correct. Use it as a tool to access information because if I take, if I burn the books and eliminate the information, I don't have to worry about you. Because that means your mindset's going to be what? Either this, this level or this level. Maybe you finish high school, maybe, okay. 
college maybe, you know, and then maybe you, you know, got a vocation or skill, maybe you're skilled, and you go here, and then, you know, maybe you know how to network and build relationships, you can go here, and then maybe you know how to create a vision, and maybe you know how to organize a plan, and you can go here, and maybe you know how to, you know, uh, maybe you know how to love yourself, you can probably get here, okay? So it's a process of understanding how to evolve based on developing yourself, because nobody's going to develop you. Nobody's going to give you anything. The value that you give yourself is the value the world gives you. The world sees you as you see yourself. Mm -hmm. It will respond to you based on how you see yourself. Right. And I'm with a, a, a person that sees herself as owning the world. She owns the world. Right. It's got a name on a lot of things. Own TV, Oprah show. You know, all of that. I'm not, I'm not saying that just to, to talk about her, because I don't talk about her much. She's got this new show coming out, Greenleaf, right? You know, and, and another show coming out. But she owns herself. Right. And the only way, she's not supposed to make it because she was abused. She was in a juvenile delinquent. Right. She didn't have a strong family base, even though she had a strong family. And so she was able to do it because of her what? Because she transformed her thinking. And when she, what she was able to do is she was able to move from a negative, negative perspective of herself to a positive image of who she is by herself, with herself. And so the answer to your problem and the answer to your business and the, and the key to your business is self. Your business is only worth as much as you are. When you create power within yourself and value within yourself, your business will grow. Because I'm not looking at your business. I'm looking at, I'm talking to you. And when you don't believe in yourself and you don't work on yourself and you don't learn any more than what you learn, your business is going to suffer as a result of that. It's all about the information and the learning. Let's... Let's talk about, you mentioned this, that we have some bad habits. And we really do have some badass habits. We really do. I, excuse me for asses in the Bible. But um, we, we really do. What, there's one habit in particular, I've talked about this all over the country, that only black people have that is so s destructive uh, and so poisonous uh, that unless we get out of this habit, I, I don't know if anything will change in the context of our community. There was a report. Um, that came out on August the 10th. We were talking about it back there in the green room uh, by the Council of Economic Policy, Richard. I don't know if you saw this report. I hope you saw this report. And uh, it's a long study that said it will take African Americans 228 years, 228 years to close the wealth gap between blacks and white folks if they do something different now. If they do not do anything different now, it will never change. That's exactly what the study said. So we have to do some things different. That's what you've been preaching and teaching and evangelizing for as long as I've been knowing you, thinking differently. And one of the ways, one of the habits, and I want you to comment on this, there was a major study uh, by A.C. Nielsen uh, last year on television viewing habits in America, all cultural groups. And black people, African Americans, watch 40% more television than any cultural group in the history of the world. We watch 72 hours of television a week. That's 10 hours of television a day. Any Negro watching 10 hours of television a day needs their behind kick. You ain't about nothing, right? So, because that's what, what is it? That's programming. It's programming us to consume. They, they build networks right? off that, of exactly. us, yeah. so, so how do we wean ourselves? How do we see ourselves moving away from that and let's say reading? Reading. The average American only reads one book a year. If you read one book a month, in five years you will have read 60 books. The average American will have only read five. So you, you, you've been talking about education, uh, which is the key to self-empowerment. Talk about some habits that we can form that will begin slowly but surely to change this process. Let, let me talk about the most powerful word in the world. All you need is this, this word right here. And it's spelled... L-O-V-E. That's all you need. 
The transformations always love. Love of books, love of travel, love of uh, work that you do, love of people, love of family, mm -hmm. love of, uh, you know, hobbies, and focus on what you love and self-actualize what you love. So, so the key to all of it is to be able to organize and write down everything you love. Then take the 24 hours, right, and make it relevant to those things that you love. Then take information, education, and knowledge and make it relevant to what you love. So the foundation of your, of your existence is always productivity, love, having a positive attitude, and being able to develop yourself based on imagining all the things that you could possibly love. That's what I learned. Mm. Because I, my, you know, the spirit of my existence is negative. I grew up looking at the glass half empty as opposed to half full. When my, li when my life changed, it changed because I realized that the transformation is always love. That transforms my feelings. You know, that eliminates all the negativity I have within my life. I get to be able to change my thinking, change what's possible for me, create a vision for myself, bigger than myself, bigger, based on love, develop a plan around that, build relationships, create a value system around that, be able to organize information and education and make it relevant to my purpose, to, my, to, to what I love and what I care about and what's important to me, and then apply that every single day to create new habits. And that's the transformation. It wouldn't make any difference what you look like, what color you are, what your background is, for every single person. It's to focus on that. Now, the question is, how difficult is it for you to transform yourself from hate to love? I mean, really. To look within yourself and say, I actually love myself. I'm going to focus on everything I love. I'm going to eliminate all the negative thoughts, all the negative activities, all the negative feelings as much as I possibly can, and I'm going to focus on love. Because there's only two choices in life. There's negative or positive. There's good or bad. There's will or won't. There's can or can't. There's looking at the glass half empty or half full. And so to be able to do that, man, when you can do that, you can trans transform your feelings you don't have to speak so harsh you don't have to be so mad you don't have to be so angry you can unpeel the onions because it, it, the relationship is about how I how you feel what the inner is the energy that you're creating within yourself that you feel that will determine how I feel about myself so when I look at you and say man I love you George I love your work it's a beautiful thing. Now, you've said that many times. I mean, you, you can feel it. that. Yeah, absolutely, that vibration, that energy. You can feel it. And you say it like And it takes mean. three seconds when you walk through that door to determine what? Yeah. Who you are. Somebody can size you up just, just like that. And so that's what I had to work on. That's what I have to work on in our relationship. It's what I have to work on with my family. It's have to work on, you know, not what happens. not what happens to you. It's how you handle it. How do you handle your feelings? Because I can feel your vibration and your energy, what? Your energy is your trajectory. So if you got bad energy, guess where you're going? I worked in the prison system five years. I'm around, I, I said, man, I gotta get out of here. The energy is too bad. Right. And so it, it, it's, it's, yeah, I was, uh, you know, consciously, there's the conscious and the unconscious. The unconscious is what runs you based on the consciousness. So whatever you receive consciously is going to be who you are because it's going to go into the unconscious. It's going to get hardwired. You're going to react based on what? Based on the conscious versus the unconscious, but the unconscious is your habits. It's what keeps you moving every single day. And so I have to purposely work on my consciousness and change my consciousness so that my habits are what? My hab I can change my habits so they don't become hardwired and I get a chance to, to change them because of the information I receive, because of the education and the knowledge I get, and because I have a process for learning that, that constantly changes my consciousness. 
so I don't have to be the same person that I grew up with and the angry guy I was and enraged, you know, and, and could have been in prison if not for basketball. Basketball was my savior because it gave me enough self-esteem to be able to believe in myself just a little bit. But to be able to really self-actualize and go around the world now and speak and talk about identity development and identity leadership, man, and to deal with all the stuff I have to deal with sometime, I got to focus on love as opposed to hate and negativity. And that's the key. Yeah. Let, let, let me say that. You know, yeah, that's, that's, you've written 12 books. I've written seven. Between us, we've written 19 books. And as I've read all of your books, you've read most of my books, I, I find that we are saying the same things differently, right? Yeah. Maybe because there is nothing else to say but that. But, but, but in essence, what I'm hearing and what I think we both want to communicate to this very, very important audience is that everything we do is so that somebody will love us. Everything we do is so that somebody will love us. Right? The clothes we wear, the successes that we achieve, is so that somebody will love us. What you're saying is we have an insatiable appetite to be loved. Right? You could tell me you love Everybody me 25 love. times. Everybody right? For love. That's right. You could tell me you love me 25 times today, and tomorrow I would be just as starved to hear that, that love 25 times, right? So that, that's very, very powerful. I mean, it, it sounds trite and simplistic, but it really is at the base and bottom of everything. It's the it? foundation for success. Yes. It's the foundation for learning. It's the foundation for creating. It's the foundation for thinking. Yes. It's the foundation for family. It's the foundation for vacations. It's the foundation for building relationships. That's right. It's the foundation. Because the law of attraction, and I didn't say it, it's physics. Whatever you put out, you get back. So if you put out hate, guess what's going to happen to you? That's right. You're going to create that in your own life, in your own environment. Because the law of attraction says whatever you put out comes back. If you put out love, guess what you're going to get back? You're going to get back love. You're going to get back love. If, if you hate somebody or you're mad and angry, when you walk through that door, I'm going to say, you know what? Man, who's that? I ain't got to go home, but I got to get out of him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you're, right. you're repelling me. You're not inviting me in. You can't invite somebody in if your fist is closed. That's why service is so great. You got to be able to, you know, the more you have, the more you can give, you, but, which is you know, based on philosophy that if you can't work on yourself and build value within yourself, you don't have a whole lot to give. That's and so the idea of being able to say, how, ask yourself, how in the world can I be of more service? you got to first start with you, loving you, before you can love anybody else and before you can give anything to anybody else. That's the key. How tough is that? Man, that's real tough when you've been beat up, right. when you've been jumped on, when you have a lot of shame. When you, you know, you, you deal with all kinds of obstacles every single day, You're, you've got a lot of stress. You know, you're probably clinically a lot of times depressed and don't even know it, you know. And so you, you, it really starts with trying to unpeel that onion and unpeel those layers. These are layers and layers and layers and layers of pain. I've been there. I understand. Right. And it takes, it doesn't take, it's not a year's journey. It it's how long, how long does it take? It takes a lifetime of working on you every single day trying to change the attitude from negative to positive. Because you might say, oh, I'm positive, I'm positive, I love myself. But in truth, the spirit of your existence is what? Every time you look at something, you look at it from the, from the standpoint of the glass half empty as opposed to half full, and the first thing you say is, I can't do it. Or you doubt yourself. Or you can be the, on the other side and say, you know what, I can do anything if I learn the process, yeah. which, is, which, which is what helped me is understanding that there is a process for success. I thought it was about race. Oh, man, I'm hung up on race. No, you don't understand the process. I thought it was about my family circumstances. No, you don't, you don't understand the process. There is a process for writing a book. That's right. And when you learn the process, you can write one book. When you write one book, you can write the, the second book is easier. That's right. And then the third book is easier. 
because there is a process for writing the book. There is a process for business. You have to have a good idea. You have to have a need in the marketplace. You have to be able to solve a, a problem. You have to, you know, you have to have a big enough audience to serve. You got to be able to brand yourself in the marketplace, okay? Personally, you got to have build a network of relationships, a database of relationships. That's what you do. You got to be able to organize your, your business. You got to have accounting. You got to have um, marketing. You got to have a, a staff advice, of people. You got to have advice. legal work. Right. You got to pay taxes. You right. got to do all of those things, right? And so business is not just about coming up with an idea and talking, you're talking about you're just going to make some money. Business is a process. It's an organizational process you have to follow the same way all the time if you want to be a successful business, and you've got to stay in, and stay in the game a long time. So business is business is business is business. It would make a difference who you are, what you look like. And once you understand the business principles and the finance principles, then it works the same way for everybody all over the world. The difference is some know it and some don't. Yeah. Um. We are down to about 10 minutes, um, and I want to ask you some fun questions. This is heavy-duty stuff. Uh, we could sit here for two or three hours and, and, and explore this. Uh, what, what I think you're helping us all to understand is, 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 is essentially a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is simply the purpose of life. And you've said this 50 different ways. You've sliced this up many different ways. But essentially, you said the purpose of life is to love to give, to serve, and to add value to somebody or something. So when you're adding value to somebody or something, you effectively are in business, right? That's what business is about, taking something and adding value to it. Um, I want to ask you some fun questions because he comes across as a very serious brother, right? He, he is a very serious brother, but he's also a very fun brother with a great sense of humor as well. So I'm going to ask you some questions that some of them might be a little funny, some of them might not, but I want people to see the other side of you as well. There's an, you're, you're multifaceted. You're this serious, profound, and pro provocative brother with an incredible story on how you've changed your life. Now I want people to see the other side of you. If you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what do you think that would be? If you were to die and come back as a person, another person or a thing, what would that be? It would be person, it would be a person. And it certainly would be Nelson Mandela. Uh, okay. Because I've, I've done a lot of stuff in South Africa. Oprah, of course, is very involved with South Africa. But people don't know my story about South Africa, which is um, we were able to spend ten, 10 days in his house. Uh, I, I was able to be in Paul's Moore prison with Bob Brown. And he was the only American to ever see Nelson Mandela. I worked for Bob Brown when he was in prison in Paul's Moore. I escorted his children down to see him when he was, I had breakfast, breakfast and dinner with Nelson Mandela after he was released with him and Winnie Mandela. Uh, so this is the greatest man that I know. You can spend 27 years in jail and they not imprison your mind. Mm -hmm. And then come out and be the president of your country and take your country from apartheid to freedom. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, Winnie Mandela was right there also, even though you know, there were some issues there, but she, she deserved a lot of credit because she kept it alive while he was in prison. And she had to deal with all of the negativity and all of the stuff that she had to deal with. It was unbelievable. Um, but to be able to do that and then they not mess up his mind. Right. Not be angry. And we don't right. have to spend 27 years in jail. <laughs> right. 
okay, locked up every single day, and we have access to the, one of the greatest free enterprise systems in the world, which is America. We're in the greatest country in the world, America. And I say that to say there is no excuses. It's just opportunity. And when we look at it as an opportunity, we say this is one of the greatest countries in the world where the schools are free, where you don't have to walk five miles to get water, where, you know, we got books and libraries. So our ability to be able to self-actualize ourselves with Maslow's greatest level of achievement is self-actualization, highest level of achievement is self-actualization. Man, we, we have it. It's right here. I just applaud you because, you know, business is the way to do it. And we live in a capitalistic society where, you know, it's about money and, and it's about finance. And, and if you learn that and you get that, that is the freedom. Okay. You're going to have to give shorter answers. Short answers, no, yeah. Shorter answers. I, I shorter wanted answers. to get that out. All right. Because we're down to five minutes and 11 seconds and we want to finish right on Go time. Ahead. All right. What is the quality that you most like in a man, a woman, or a friend? What is that quality you most like in a man, a woman, or a friend? And or all three? Trust, number one. Trust, number in one. In the story. First. And First, in the story. Okay. What do you most value in your friends? Trust, Trust. in the story. <laughs> okay. Who are your favorite writers? Give me two or three of your favorite writers, people you love to read. Uh, Stephen Covey. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Scott Pett, The Road Less Travel. Sc Scott Peck. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Um, uh, I like business books, you know, yeah. all that process okay. material. Yeah. Who are your heroes in fiction and in life? Now, I think you already talked about one in life. That's Nelson Mandela. He's passed. Yeah. But who's your, who are your heroes in fiction or in life? Well, I'm, I'm fortunate to be with one of the greatest women in the world. Really? And yeah, so, I mean, I'm in a relationship with her. I'm saying, wow, who are you? <laughs> I've never seen anybody like you. She's now, uh, you know, she's doing a big, uh, 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 big movie now. But, I mean, what she does, be able to, I mean, here's a woman that's, you know, came from nothing. Right and self-made, and just unbelievable. It's incredible. So we're talking about Oprah? Oprah. <laughs> I okay. hope so. Next question, next question, <laughs> next question. We're down to three minutes, 21 seconds. What is your greatest fear? Um, my greatest fear is not being able to finish the job of teaching identity development all over the world. It's my greatest fear. Okay. Uh, which living person do you most admire? Living person, most admire? Living person that you most admire, other than Oprah. <laughs> we know you, you yeah, admire you Mandela, know, I, uh, but living, living person. person most admire, I said, I have to think. Wow. Living person most admire, probably my granddaughter. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, that's good. All right. What trait do you most hate in other people? What? What trait do you most deplore or hate in other people? We talked about what you love about other people, trust. Yeah. But what, do you, what, what thing do you hate in, a, in another person? Uh, not being able to count on them. You know, they say something and then right, right, not right. being able to count on them. Okay, okay. What is your greatest extravagance? Um, you know, I, 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 I love antique cars. Antique cars? Right. Okay. You I don't have any, but I love them. I was going to ask you. All right, so that would, all right, so what, what, what is it that you have that you would consider an extravagance? I, I love antique cars, too. I love them. Yeah. I, I would say uh, I'm a big golfer. I mean, David okay. and I played golf yesterday, so for me, really being extravagant is being on the golf course right. and, you know, being at the country club and, you know, going out, going out to eat after that and, you know, and all of that. So golf is, is, golf. is yeah, golf okay. is it. On what occasion do you lie? 
Lie. Mm -hmm. What occasion do you lie? I try very hard not to lie, right. but... <laughs> when you don't want to hurt a person's feelings? A white lie? I would say when I'm trying to transform uh, a negative feeling mm -hmm. to a positive one. Mm -hmm. And I know that the positive one is what I'm trying to work on, trying to be positive okay. when I actually feel negative. Okay, I got you. That's good, that's good. Okay. What living person do you most despise? What? What living person do you most hate, despise? Is there anybody you despise? I don't despise anybody, no. Okay. I thought you were going to say Donald no. Trump. Um, <clears throat> Which, and we're down to the last two questions, which talent... Actually, Donald Trump is a nice guy. I've known him for 30 years. Yeah. Actually, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Probably you know. a different television for I some mean, reason. what, you know, whatever, he's, I know him, I know him for 30 years, a nice guy. Okay. Okay. Which talent would you most like to have that you don't have? Which? Which talent would you most like to have that you don't have? Man, I wish I could sing. Sing. If I could sing. Oh, you, you'd be dangerous. You'd be dangerous. Okay, the final question. We're down to the last few seconds. And you don't have to, you, you, can, you can just give me the first letter. You don't have to answer this uh, uh, fully because we're in a church. Um, what's your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word would be damn. Well, damn is in the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, Stedman Graham. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Uh, right on time. two or three parking lots full of people. So we're gonna go ahead and got, ask you guys to head over to your tables. At 6.30, we're gonna have the, the town hall. So we'll start to announce that. So we have David Banner in the building. We have Jeff Johnson, Dr. Ellis here, Monica Green. So it's gonna be powerful, but head back to your tables and then we'll go ahead and get people over to the tables, man. Let's enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>